It is. Um, well, we should probably move forward here and let me uh, welcome everybody to the March 2023 version of the Upper Clark Fort Working Group's virtual seminar series. We are very fortunate and happy today to have Dr. Rob Thomas, who's a professor of geology and environmental science. Um, he has a long list of um, accolades as an educator, as a researcher. I just want to mention a couple of them. He's a regents professor in the Montana University System and a Carnegie What's U.S. That? professor. Uh, like he received his BA really? from Humboldt State, and we were just discussing his history and the role that mountains and University of Montana have played. How he received his um, master's there uh, at the University of Montana, and then went on to get his PhD in geology from the University of Washington. He's a fellow of the Geological Science of America, and his interests relate to environmental sedimentology, the geology of Yellowstone, and things as diverse as Cambrian mass extinction. As I mentioned, he has a long list of awards, and many of them relate to his role as an educator. Um, his clear uh, dedication to education is manifested in interactions with Sherpas in Nepal, students on the high seas or in the Caribbean or out on the Earth's crust during geology field camp. He has over 60 publications and he's currently a professor of environmental sciences at UM, uh, sorry, at, uh, UM Western in Dillon. He's also actively involved in um, this um, large and diverse group uh, that includes all of you interested in the Clark Fork River and um, the components of the of the systems and as they respond to remediation and restoration and today he's going to talk about as you can see on the screen uh re remediation assessment so thanks very much rob thank you very much mari um it's a pleasure to be here uh and uh what i'll be speaking on today is uh, work that undergraduates have been doing uh from western on the upper clark fork in the galen area and uh I'll uh, emphasize uh, this educational component because uh, Western is uh, uniquely uh, designed for engaging uh, undergraduate students in this kind of work. All right, so how do we do this? Well, the, the bottom line is uh, uh, Western's setup is one where the students take a single class at a time for 18 instructional days. We call it experience one. It, it Like all good ideas, uh, uh, we stole it from Colorado College, uh, who pioneered this block system back in the late 1960s. And uh, we use it for experiential learning uh, so that we have blocks of time to engage students in work. So uh, for me, uh, I've been working on streams. We've, we've been on the block system for now 20 years, and it's been very successful. And, and I've had students working for years on the uh, upper big hole, uh, working on the fluvial arctic grayling issue. And I've also had students uh, doing projects uh, more locally uh, with a remediation. Actually, it was a total restoration of uh, Point Dexter Slough. Uh, a former channel of the Beaverhead that's kind of like a Spring Creek um, in in the Dillon area, and uh, and then about four years ago, I got contacted by Alex Leon at the uh, Clark Fork Coalition um, to bring students up and start doing some work on the Upper Clark Fork. So um, we we did that and. Uh, the goal for me is to expose these students to what you all do uh, as land managers um, so that they can, you know, uh, build a portfolio that's filled with skills and samples of their work uh, so that they can get jobs. I mean, everybody these days wants two years of experience out of a college graduate. And how are they supposed to get that? Well, um, summer experiences maybe, but uh, we try to provide it during the school year using our block system, our, our experience one system. And 
most importantly, in many ways, society directly benefits from their investment in education. I, uh, the benefits of investing in education are you know, clear to us in education, uh, but uh, sometimes it's harder for the public to see that. And so uh, seeing students out on the river and gathering data and providing information that is useful in making land management decisions, uh, that has a direct impact on people's thinking about education. And we've been fortunate in that uh, uh, Dave uh, McCumber and, and Duncan Adams and others have done some features on the work out there in the Upper Clark Park by the students. So this is what it looks like. Okay, so those students are literally out day two uh, on the river uh, in class. So uh, what will happen is uh, the um, whoever it is that we're working for uh, will come speak to the class like a consulting firm. Um, so Alex will come down. He'll speak to the class about what you know what the, the project is, what's going on with the Clark Fork, so that they have the big picture. And then I form them into groups. And the next day we're in the rigs and we're headed up to the Clark Fork and uh, they're learning immediately what to do. And within a few days, they are usually coming to me and wanting to make adjustments uh, to what's going on uh, because they're figuring out what's working and what's not working, which is wonderful. Okay, so why are we up there? Again, undergraduate education. If the data that the students find and put together and make available um, are of value to land managers, that's great, but that is not our goal. Um, our goal, my goal is undergraduate education. I want these students to get real experiences. And so um, I, you know, I'm very grateful to uh, the Clark Park Coalition, to, uh, uh, you know, Nathan Cook has helped us out a lot at NRDP. Uh, Karen Boyd uh, has helped us out tremendously uh, with applied geomorph. Um, the, the landowner, uh, Hans Lambert, uh, he, you know, I spend time with him when I'm out there. He's interested in what the students are doing. He allows us to be out on his property. Uh, these are all really good learning things for the students to be uh, involved with these different stakeholders and seeing, you know, the science as well as the, the non-science part of it all. Okay, so hopefully again, the data are useful for remediation. Uh, we mostly focus on baseline studies, uh, then post-remediation studies uh, to get an assessment on what has you know transpired? Are, are we getting what we want uh, out of the remediation? So the students need to hear from the land managers what the goal is, um, so that they can assess that in the um, work that they're doing. We do sometimes some special projects. Things come up. Uh, we had a, a a fish kill event uh, in 2019 when we first went up. And we had to adjust very quickly. It happened a couple of weeks before uh, we had intended to do a full-blown baseline study of phase three uh, near Galen. And so we readjusted to deal with uh, what was going on with, you know, these slicken areas, which, uh, you know, most of you are familiar with, these dead zones on the floodplain. And uh, there had been a, um, there had been a, um, water event uh whoops let's go back there have been a uh no it won't no there we go <laughs> there we go there'd been a water event uh on the slicken and uh it had uh spilled out into the river you can see the discharge points here where the cow pies backed up behind the discharge and uh there'd been a fish kill and so we decided to focus the study of the in-stream macroinvertebrates 
uh, on these discharge areas for that study. And uh, instead of looking at a more broad uh, view of macroinvertebrates uh, within the whole phase. Okay. So most of you again are familiar with the background, for, but for those that are not, uh, flooding in 1908 transported uh, metallic minerals onto the Clark Fork, creating these dead zones or slickens. Um, so the floodplain is covered with um, metallic minerals. Uh, and they need to be removed. Uh, in the process of waiting for them to be able to be removed, uh, temporary levees have been built um, to contain slick and runoff uh, with variable success, especially as time has gone on. And uh, uh, the goal is then to get to remove these contaminated floodplain sediments and put them in a secure containment facility. Um, Stream banks are typically stabilized in phases, say, one and two, uh, with core logs um, and uh, also with vegetation. And uh, channel sediments are generally not removed because uh, the channel is not part of the agreement. And for those, again, that have not been out there and seen this, here's what it looks like. You see they're stripping off the metals from the floodplain. And then they're going to load those into a loader and transport them to a containment facility. You can also see there's quite a connection between the um, metal remove area and the river itself. And uh, the students noted that, and I know that uh, I've been told that there's going to be a change in approach to try to minimize that connection during the work going forward, if not already has happened. Okay, so uh, one of the things that I think about a lot is uh, the importance of channel morphology out there. The, the sediments, remember, in the channel are not being removed, but there is change to the channel that is occurring as a result of removing contaminated sediments off the floodplain um, because the banks are being impacted and the, they have to be rebuilt. And ideally, what we want is an asymmetric channel. This is a low gradient meandering stream and it should have a uh, good helical flow. And that helical flow should be developing a well-developed undercut cut bank um, with sediment being deposited on a point bar with migration occurring across the floodplain. And uh, so this is a, from a fisheries standpoint, uh, a very important aspect of the remediation that we have been assessing in our work at Western. All right, so the areas that we've been working have included phases one, two, three, and part of four, um, as well as actually uh, phase uh, five. Um, we've done some work down there, but the primary focus was uh, between 2019, where we did a baseline study in phase three, and uh, a 2022 redo of that phase three and, and phase four, up, upper phase four, <laughs> excuse me, area. And you can see over here on the left, uh, the cross sections, one to 25. So, you know, we've got pretty good coverage along the length of the, of the uh, river here that we're working on, where the students are conducting uh, um, stream surveys um, by creating cross sections and uh, gathering a variety of other data, which I'll go over. Okay, so stream morphology, uh, what are our methods? So again, I put these students into teams. They have some experience coming in because they've taken a class in hydrology from Becca Levine 
Uh, they've taken a class in geomorphology from Becca Levine. For those that know Dr. Levine here at Western, she's great. And the students come in ready to roll. And so I put them into teams, put them out on the site. I don't have to do much. They, uh, they know how to set up these cross sections and to uh, create the channel profiles. So uh, they conducted for the baseline a total of 24 cross sections um, in 2019. And then those were resurveyed in 2022. Uh, to evaluate changes uh, post remediation in the channel profile. We also look at wet depth ratios because again, we're interested in that channel having that asymmetric profile. And so uh, if, the, if the remediation work is resulting in a channel that's really wide and shallow, we wanna document that because that's not good for the fisheries. Um, we look at uh, stream sediment. We do pebble counts using gravelometers um, and then do statistical analyses on those data. And the goal with that is to assess siltation. Um, the good news is that most of the sediment in uh, this reach of the uh, big of the uh, upper Clark port is uh, uh, gravel, uh, a lot of it outwash. Um, and uh, uh, so that large Gravel and sand size material uh, is, you know, good from a standpoint of uh, having a siltation problem uh, compared to projects we've worked on down in the Beaverhead where siltation is a very large problem. Um, and then we look at the stability of the banks by looking at bank erosion hazard index calculations. Uh, these are uh, a variety of different measures. Uh, that the students do with the goal of just getting at how stable is that bank um, and how does it uh, allow us to assess the remediation techniques that are used to stabilize those banks, which I'll be returning to. Okay, so uh, some of the data. So here's, here's a typical stream morphology cross-section uh, that the students have uh, put together. Um, in the upper photo is cross-section four looking upstream in 2019, and you can see it in the exact same point uh, in uh, 2022 post-remediation. And if you look to the left, you can see the cross-section change 2019 to 2022, um, and you can see that it's changed a little bit. Um, it's a little shallower, as you would expect, um, a little broader, you know, a little greater width depth ratio. Um, again, which you would expect. But what the students did find in doing analyses of channel profile um, is that from 2019 to 22, there really wasn't a consistent change. Seven of them, uh, the cross sections were more asymmetrical, uh, which is good. That's what we want. Uh, four of them were less asymmetrical, um, you know, more in that direction of a dish plate, not good for fish and five were no change. So there wasn't really a strong pattern uh, that uh, was shown in the, uh, the cross-section data uh, that the students gathered. So that was, I considered to be generally good news. All right, with depth ratios. So the students calculate with depth ratios uh, through these, uh, through the whole, segment uh, that they are doing these cross sections. So they're measuring width depth ratios at an interval from top to bottom within the reach that they're working on. And you can see what the data show. 2019 to 2022, the numbers went up. So what that means is that we've had an increase uh, in width to depth, and that means the stream's gotten a little wider, uh, the stream's gotten a little shallower. And uh, that is, to be expected with the kind of work that's being done out there. And it is in, particularly, uh, in particular to be expected given that the channel itself is not being uh, remediated. Um, so you're not building channel uh, in the remediation process. You're stripping away these uh, contaminants off the floodplain. Um, you're affecting the banks for sure, but you're not really having, a, a, you know, you're not going in there reconstructing the channel uh, to build the kind of stream morphology that might be more conducive 
to an improved fisheries. All right, the beehives. So uh, again, these beehive calculations involve a lot of different factors. Um, and uh, uh, these are standard things that are done. And so the students follow those standard protocols. And what they found was that on average, uh, where core logs were used to stabilize the banks, the channel profiles had a higher um, width depth ratio um, and uh, looked more like a dish plate. And uh, where vegetation was used in uh, stabilizing the bank, like you can see in the photo on the right, um, they got uh, uh, more of the, of the kind of asymmetry in the profile with a nice undercut cut bank, rising point bar, uh, like we want to see, optimal stream channel morphology. And so uh, that seems to be working. Now, it turns out that in the remediation uh, in, in the fall, summer and fall that they were doing out there, uh, they had supply chain problems and couldn't get the core logs, or at least that's what I'm told. And so they ended up using vegetation as a result. And uh, that vegetative uh, bank stabilization has resulted in a better stream morphology as documented by the students. Um, uh, anecdotal data from me walking around, uh, every place where I saw fish starting out as I was walking around in the stream were in these cut bank areas where vegetation was being used as the bank stabilization technique. Again, but that's totally anecdotal. All right, so bugs. So we, we look at bugs because electroshocking fish is beyond my pay grade and that of my students. So uh, we do a very systematic process of collecting bugs. We use server samplers, not kick nets. Um, and so we have a measured area. We time the amount of time the students are uh, gathering uh, the materials out of the bottom. They use a trowel and they dig down into the substrate. And then they uh, uh, take that, they empty it into a gridded uh, pan, and then they time the amount of time that they pick that gridded pan. And the goal with that is uh, to uh, you know not overpick a pan that's got lots of bugs um, and bias the data in that way. So we we time it to result, you know, to reduce the bias um, and try to just as much as possible make every collection as um, consistent as we possibly can. They're identifying the bugs to the familial level because again, anything lower than that, for those that work with these macro invertebrates, that's beyond our pay grade. Um, and, uh, you know, to get a handle on diversity and total bug numbers and uh, richness of diversity and so on, the, the familial level is fine. So they do analyses on those data. Most, all these students have had stats in advance of the class. And so they'll take their data, they process it all um, after going through and separating out all the bugs in the lab and counting everything and identifying everything. They will put the data into, uh, you know, do some statistical analyses. Uh, primarily, we focus on Simpsons, uh, which is a diversity calculation, and Margolabs, which is a richness uh, calculation, because we want you know, to see that that diversity is rich. You, you can have diversity with 90% of what you've got being one family of patus fly. Um, and uh, we, so we want to see is that is that diversity rich. All right. So again, in 2019, I'll come back to it. We didn't do uh, a full on uh, macro invertebrate collection from top to bottom. Um, in phase three and upper phase four. We did uh, something different because of the fish kill. Um, we did do that uh, macroinvertebrate collection in 2022. And generally what we saw is numbers look pretty good. Uh, most of these, you know, you can see a high count here, over 100 bugs and, and at this cross-section 10. 
uh, some of these lower ones here, it's something shy of 20. But this is all just post remediation. I mean, they were working out there while we were collecting macroinvertebrates. So uh, it's been my experience that the macroinvertebrates are pretty resilient and can come back uh, pretty quickly from uh, the remediation process. And that's that's what I think we're seeing uh, on the Upper Clark Park as well. All right. And uh, the data on diversity and richness also looks pretty good. So that uh, uh, these calculations that you're seeing on the right uh, by cross-section site um, uh, are where I want to see most of them. I mean, there's some low ones in here for sure. Uh, but uh, a lot of them are in the, you know, in the kind of range above 0.6 here on Simpsons, uh, which is great. You know, one is, uh, is the, you know, maximum diversity uh, that we want to see. And the, and the richness of that diversity also looks pretty good. And uh, so generally, again, the remediation appears to uh, be not devastating the in-stream macroinvertebrate population. And then just as a visual analysis, I took all the data that uh, the students did this. They, they took all the data that um, existed from the 2019 study, put it, whoops, put it together into a pie diagram. And uh, you can compare that with the 2022 data. And it, you know, it's very visually clear that the uh, uh, diversity uh, went up a lot post remediation. And so uh, that's good news with regard to the impacts that the remediation has on macro, in-stream macro invertebrates. Okay, geochemistry. So in 2019, we were planning to go out there and do a full blown kind of standard assessment uh, that a pre, you know, baseline assessment before the remediation that I would normally have had classes do, like we did on the upper big hole for years. Um, it would have included doing um, macroinvertebrate analyses at every cross section that the students were doing. And we would have also looked at riparian vegetation. And uh, there was a fish kill about, I think, two weeks in advance of uh, the students going out there. They go out at the same time of year in the fall, what we call block two. Uh, it's uh, in September and early October. And uh, there'd been this fish kill in 2019 because there'd been a rain event that had uh, caused blowouts on the slickens. And you can see that in this diagram here, uh, there's the blowout across the floodplain, and there's the discharge right there. So what we decided to do is I had some students who had some really good skills with uh, GIS and GPS and sediment mapping coming out of uh, Dr. Levine's classes. And so I put them in a group and had them go in and make a sediment map of the bottom of the stream around these uh, slickens that had blown out. And so the data that you're looking at in the stream itself here going around this cut bank loop, the, the flow, by the way, is going from the left over here to the right. Okay, there's north arrow. And you can see what they've made is a, a diagram that shows cobbles, fines, pebbles, um, and then vegetation. They've also documented vegetation. And uh, they literally made a map of the stream sediment on the bottom. Uh, so they walk very carefully through there, a team of three or four people walking in a line uh, through the stream, using a gravelometer to make uh, uh, numerical measurements uh, of the uh, grain sizes using a protocol, and then making the map uh, using GPS data as they walked along. So, uh, and then they just dropped it into GIS and, you know, fancied it up so that uh, it could be presented in the report. Um, we then decided that let's take a look at how the macroinvertebrates responded to uh, this event, this discharge event. Again, electroshocking fish is past, it's beyond our pay grade. And, uh, you know, the fish kill already happened. So, you know, the, it was like, well, let's take a look at the bugs. Let's see how the macroinvertebrates did. 
So as you, again, the flow's going this way, and the discharge that broke across the slicken is right through here. It's very clearly visible. And you can see there's the discharge delta right there. So you can see there's fines in yellow. And here's a little delta accumulation of fines right there in yellow. Uh, that's uh, sand-sized material, uh, orange. Here you can see a picture of what it looks like. Um, it's the contaminants off the floodplain. Um, it's the metal sediment. And it made a little deltaic accumulation. And so then when you look at the bugs, um, so here's a collection site upstream. They got a total of 116 bugs, 10 families. Okay, those numbers look kind of normal to me. Whoops, things very sensitive. All right, and you go downstream and you look below the discharge point, which is right here. And you can see here's a, a total of 28 bugs with family of seven. Uh, here's 76, uh, families uh, number six, you know, down quite a bit uh, from upstream of that discharge. Here's 106 upstream total bugs. Here's 116 total bugs upstream. Again, these were all sampled from uh, similar habitats, and they were using protocols that were very uh, you know, tightly constrained to make sure that we were collecting these macroinvertebrates identically, uh, if you will, from place to place to place. So then we gathered uh, samples for uh, geochemical analysis. We ran initially uh, at uh, uh, using an XRF gun that uh, uh, Tech had um, with the help of Dr. Chris Gammons. And uh, we then uh, ran them at uh, Energy Labs using Cruise grant money. Thank you, Cruise. And uh, uh, we um, found that, yeah, indeed, sorry. Yes, indeed, uh, you know, at the discharge areas, here's the discharge right here, and you can see this big spike in arsenic. So there was a correlation between where the discharge of sediment was, a decline in macroinvertebrates, and a spike in metals, um, as, you know, frankly, you would expect. So it's telling us that we got to get these sediments uh, from these slickens out of there um, because uh, they're, you know, when they get liberated and you get a <clears throat> event that takes these metals that are in solution as ions, puts them into the water, uh, that causes, you know, not only fish kill, but also bug kill. All right, so some of the follow-up that will occur after the students have worked on this will be done as internships or senior thesis projects. Uh, I've got a student doing a geochemical uh, study right now as a senior thesis as a follow-up. She was on the uh, site in uh, the fall. And uh, in this particular case, we got data that I believe Karen Boyd had collected. Um, and uh, looking at 2011 to 2019 aerial data, uh, these were distributions um, of, uh, of slickens. And so this student, Margaret Anderson, she had a lot of skills with GIS. And so she made maps using the data that show the distribution of these slickens of the data gathered by Karen um, so that managers you know, can use those data uh, if, if they need going forward. Um, she also looked at erosion. Uh, again, I think these were Karen Boyd data uh, so that we can see, you know, where, um, you know, where erosion is taking place on the stream. Is it cutting into the slickens and liberating the slicken sediments into the channel, uh, et cetera? Uh, there's a lot of uses of those data, frankly. And uh, really nice to have them put together in a GIS map uh, that people can access and use. All right. And then once all this is done uh, in the field and the students have gathered their data and they've analyzed their data, they construct a report. Um, I worked in the geotechnical consult consulting industry for about six years, seven years. And uh, uh, so I just had the students put together a standard uh, environmental report. 
Um, these are professional reports. They, they have to sign off on their work as staff scientists so that, that it's serious. Um, they recognize that people are looking at their data uh, beyond surrogate dad here at Western, and uh, uh, they uh, really up the level of their game and, and uh, uh, do a very, uh, I think, quality job uh, for um, undergraduate students. I mean, these are 18 to 22 year olds for the most part, not all of them, but many of them. And then once those reports are made, uh, they are available to the public. So these are all accessible. I have PDF copies of all these. They are accessible to anybody who wants them. And again, my primary goal is student education. So the students are job ready. Uh, this is Erin McGowan. She started on this project in 2019 and she was working in 2022 for Tetra Tech. Uh, and helped us to get around on the job site and helped us out uh, with access and, and so on. Uh, and it was really great for the students to see a former student working as a professional as a result of the, you know, this kind of experience that they're gaining at the undergraduate level. All right, and then finally, and not least important, the students have to defend their work, just like every other land manager and scientist. So they have to, at the end of class, their final is to take their data and uh, the uh, give a Zoom or in-person presentation or both um, to the stakeholders. And so uh, they will be speaking to agency personnel, uh, Alex with the Clark Park Coalition and many others and they make recommendations. Uh, and uh, again, we don't make decisions, um, but I do want them analyzing their data to a point where they can make a recommendation from it. So they take the data and uh, they uh, present their recommendations and have to defend those um, with the managers. And uh, that's excellent preparation uh, for being a professional. So what did they find? Uh, they found that uh, continuing the use of vegetative bank stabilization treatments it was a good idea because those core logs have a tendency to create an aqueduct. Um, I mean, they're really good at armoring the bank and stabilizing the bank. Maybe too good, especially in this very dry climate that we're in, where it takes a long time for them to break down and for the natural channel morphology to start to develop. Um, We'll see going forward how this vegetative bank treatment that was done in phase three and four uh, goes going forward. That'll be part of the, um, uh, the assessment that students will do going forward. And they had suggested that we compare phases three and four because it was mostly vegetation with phases one and two, which were mostly core log applications uh, going forward, which I thought was an excellent idea. Uh, with regard to, you know, further assessing uh, what's the right bank treatment to use for better stream morphology. Um, uh, we know that the current remediation plan favors uh, recovery of the macroinvertebrates. That's good news. Um, we need to keep conducting geochemical analyses of the channel sediments uh, out there pre and post remediation as we go along because Again, the goal is to create a clean and healthful environment. And so removing the metals is the top priority. I understand that. And the geochemical analysis has been really important uh, to uh, the assessment. And then finally, uh, this considering the sediment catchment applications during remediation so that that connection between the sediment removal off the floodplain and the channel is not correct. And again, I've been told that that is happening. All right, so with that, I wanna thank NSF EPSCOR Cruz uh, for uh, three rounds of funding that I've had to help pay for mostly geochemical analyses um, and uh, other costs uh, associated with this project. Um, I could not have done any of this, would not have been up on the Clark Fork had it not been for Alex 
Leon and the Clark Fork Coalition and, and uh, Alex's expertise on the science and management of what's going on uh, in that region help get me up to speed. And again, NRDP has been essential and extremely helpful. Uh, and we've used many data from Karen Boyd, uh, who is arguably the best fluvial geomorphologist in the state. Oh, and Hans Lambert, uh, the landowner out there again, uh, who allows our students to be out there and learn, which is the goal. All right, with that, thank you very much. Happy to entertain questions. Oh, can't hear you, Mari. One of the shortcomings of Zoom is that it's hard to applaud, but I guess you could use your little oh. icon. <laughs> yeah. But thanks, Rob. That oh, was, yeah. um, enjoyable and, and inspiring. It's great to see the student participation. Many of us hope to have students involved in our labs, and it's great to see the integration that you've done so successfully. Yeah, they're 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 as you know, Mari, they're they're a lot more capable than we sometimes think, right? And uh, when they're put on something serious, even these eighteen to twenty-two year olds, um, they really come up to the challenge. It's impressive. I agree. I, you said a high bar. They they tend to rise up there. They do. Let's open the floor to questions for Rob that uh, folks might have about any aspect of, of what he's covered. Um, if you have one, please just click off the mute button and fire it out there. It must have been the clarity. Well, I've got one. It's not that clear. It wasn't that clear. Uh, you you emphasized, uh, or not, perhaps not purposely, but in many illustrations, you know, often a time course of data that you're you're compiling in some cases yes do you do you are there you know you always have sort of like these ideas of like at some point turning around and assessing the bigger picture do you ever like engage a class in i know that's not, not really emphasizing the field work but have you engaged in sort of synoptic assessment of the, these these compiled sets yeah uh yeah we definitely we did that on I haven't done that on the Clark Fork yet, but we did that on the Upper Big Hole. So uh, we got to a point in the Upper Big Hole. I was up there for a decade with students. So we got to the point where you know we'd done all the tributaries. We mostly were working you know around Wisdom, right, and upstream from Wisdom, and because that's that that you know uh, important habitat for fluvial Arctic grayling, and so we. Uh, you know, we'd done Swamp Creek and Steel Creek and, uh, you know, I could go on, you know, Rock Creek, on and on and on. And so we then started, you know, overall looking at um, a big picture assessment from those data of uh, the trend in the direction that the, the issue up there was we were trying to do more work with the channel, right? So uh, we were trying to get that channel had been beaten up pretty badly by cattle grazing. So it was broad and shallow. And it wasn't functioning properly. That this is an issue for the Clark Park as well, frankly. And uh, it, um, we the electric fencing was put up. The cows were taken out, and uh, a couple of floods occurred, and the stream morphology started coming back right away. And so I had the students did a big synopsic. You know, they did a big. Uh, you know, analyses of all the data that we've gathered to see overall had the upper drainage improved towards really what had become a braided stream uh, that looked like a dish plate to a meandering stream with good asymmetry and a single channel. Um, and the, the, the answer to that was that yes, indeed, it had occurred. Um, through the whole system. So not just stream by stream by stream, but the entire uh, upper drainage had, you know, turned into the proper stream habitat. And we were doing more good with less water. So, I mean, they put a little extra water into the stream through, you know, various negotiations that were beyond my pay grade. But the channel morphology 
if you can narrow the channel up and create undercut banks, you know, you're doing more work for fish with the same amount or less water, right? And so this is a critical component of thinking going forward on the upper Clark Fork, in my view. Great. What about other questions for Rob? Rob, you saw that uh, arsenic signal, but did you see other stuff there? Um, it seems oh, yeah. like copper would have really shown up, but I... <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I obviously picked arsenic because that's the one that gets people's attention. Um, but yeah, the there were spikes and everything. There were. Okay. You know, the, the, the standard players, you know the players. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, uh, copper, lead, zinc, cadmium, et cetera. Yep. And that XRF, that's that, that's a fieldable instrument you can take out there and zap things with, is that? Yeah, it, it is. Um, I unfortunately don't yet own one, but that's on my that's on my wish list. Um, so we borrowed, Chris Gammons uh, has one to tech and uh, we, we borrowed that. So we took samples that we had collected and uh, I wanted the students to have data to work with before uh, you know, their class was over because you know, these classes only go for three and a half weeks. So we gotta, we gotta move. And so uh, Chris you know, did a base you know, analysis using the XRF gun. My students did it. He showed them how to use the gun and then they did it in his lab. And uh, uh, it, and then I sent the stuff off to uh, energy labs for ICPMS analyses, and then I had a student do a senior thesis on those data. Excellent, thanks. And all that's publicly available. So you know, if you, you need access to that, I'm pretty confident that you know. I, I mean, I have no problem with sharing every bit of those data. That's public data. So even the you know the geochemistry. All of it, um, you know, is uh, available to folks. Just ask. <laughs> hey, yeah, Rod. Hey, this is Steve Hill with in Anaconda. I'm yes, with the uh, Clark Fork River Basin Advisory Council. And yes. one question: Have you done follow up on these samples below, within? And above the discharge from the slickens, because those were one-time events. Yeah. Do they do they do they trail off later yeah. or do they yes. sustain themselves? Okay. So yes, we 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 did that, but unfortunately, um so yes, the, the answer is yes. So we did <laughs> we COVID hit. Um <laughs> and uh uh COVID played, you know, heck on. Uh, my ability to get students up there and work, you know, uh, you know, as much as I wanted to, uh, but because uh, of transporting them in the vehicles, you know. Um, but yes, we did uh, reevaluate, and yes, the numbers, um, you know, uh, rebounded uh, to you know uh, the spikes went away. Uh, the environment rebounded, and we resampled sites uh, in 2022 that had been um, hot spots in 2019. But remember, it, the that was after remediation, and even though they're not remediating the channel, they are remediating the banks, and uh, so uh, there's some disruption that is occurring uh, to. You know that, but we did resample those, and they look fine. Uh, that I've got a student working those data right now. All right, thanks. You bet. I should say they look as fine as the Clark Park can look. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> now come on, <laughs> come on. That, that is a. That is a perfect segue to the question in the chat. <laughs> okay. Rob, yeah. I'll read it to you. You okay. mentioned you mentioned the width to depth ratio of the upper Clark Fork channel several times. Yes. Do you believe that the historical width to depth ratio could have been much narrower? What evidence is out there 
And how can you investigate that further with the students? In essence, what's the, what what did this system look like back in the day? Okay, I'm. This is completely off the top of my head, but uh, um, I do think that uh, human use, right, of the system has an impact that causes an increase in width depth ratio. Uh, you know, we, we see that directly on the upper big hole. I mean, there's just no question about it. You know, the cows come in and water along the banks, they beat the banks back, um, and uh, you uh, that liberates sediment that then goes into the river and you've both widened it and you've shallowed it. Uh, and so you increase width depth ratios, it is what happens. Um, you know, it's basically, you know, the system should have banks that cab off, right? That's how it slows the water down on the cut bank. But if it's if it's calving off anomalously fast or calving off in parts of the stream that would normally be stabilized, that's a function of manage, uh, you know, of, of use of, of land use by people uh, that is accelerating that rate of erosion and sediment input, and as a result causing two problems, increased width depth ratios and increasing siltation, uh, depending on what you've got access to in terms of sediment from the banks. Um, and in the upper big hole, you know, there, there was fine grain sediment access. And so there was a little bit of siltation, but not too bad. Uh, down in the big hole, in the beaver head, it's really bad. Um, so like Poindexter Slough, uh, that thing silts up, you know, like nobody's business if the banks are not stabilized um, because there's plenty of fines available uh, to do so. So the question then would be, how could you check the past of the river and what it looked like? Well, one of the things that we'd done on the upper big hole was we looked at, you know, the oldest data that we could get our hands on with regard to aerial photography on the upper big hole. And um, I don't know, as I recall, 20s, we had data that went back to the 1920s. Uh, aerial data on the upper big hole around wisdom. And that allowed us to see some pretty dramatic changes, frankly, in uh, the width of the channel, the amount of channels. <laughs> because again, this, uh, you know, if you if you beat the banks in a system that's built on glacial outwash, it, it, it goes back to where it began, which is a, a, a braided stream, because that's what it was when it was glacial outwash, it was a braided stream. And so once it stabilizes post-glacial, uh, it becomes a meandering stream. If you liberate that bank sediment, it goes back to being braided. And so from the aerial photography, we could see that it had become a single, you know, it had become a braided stream from the 1920s. So if there's past aerial data, uh, that could be helpful. Um, and the other thing that strikes me is, we could easily go in, take um, uh, just modern aerial data and look at old meander scars and measure the meander scars and see how do the meander scars measure up to the river width depth. I mean, we can't get depth, but I can get width, <laughs> right? So I could put a student on, maybe I'll do that. I could put a student on measuring uh, meander scars all through the De Deer Lodge Valley and compare that to the width of the river today. How's that? It's a pretty good answer. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you're a geologist. You should be you should be able to deal with the past. Yeah. It, I you know you you think about trying to map out the stream in the sediment you know in the sedimentology, the amount of data you'd have to take you know shallow coring you'd have to do and so on is just onerous. It would take forever. Any other questions for Rob? Hi, uh, this is Dan Olson. Um, hey, Dan. We talked about uh, basically up on the upper big hole, uh, reducing the cattle impact on the on the stream and how it improved the the uh, um, the geomorphology of the stream. Um, and also in some of your photos for the remediation, that was kind of the same problem, except it was caused by another animal, a cat. <laughs> at, at excavator, yes. uh, did they come up? Did your students come up with recommendations for 
when they're remediating, remediating and rebuilding point bars and things like that, or um, the uh, uh, cut banks and whatever, that they can improve uh, the, the stream channel, kind of like what happened in the big hole. Thanks. Yes, that's a great question. So uh, this wasn't done. And I understand, you know, we, again, we do not make the decisions about what happens up there. Uh, you know, the managers have a holistic picture and, and that's not our job. Um, my job is education, but I do want them acting as professionals. So they should take their data and make recommendations. And in 2019, uh, when we did a baseline study, uh, the students, you know, we get together at the, you know, and in the last few days of the class and really pour over the data and come to recommendations. And one of the things that they had recommended was that the vertical wall in uh, the uh, channel be left alone because you had over 100 years of vegetation, of vegetative growth since, you know, the flooding in 1908 um, that was going to be removed in order to remove the metals off the floodplain, which I get, I understand. Um, but they were suggesting that the vegetated vertical walls of the banks were so important to habitat uh, for a variety of organisms and function of the stream that it was worth leaving that little bit of metal in that vertical wall, going back about a foot away from the vertical wall uh, of the channel and then stripping everything off from there. They made that suggestion. That didn't happen, but they did make that suggestion. But it looks like you've got the data, at least from the big hole, that that sort of, uh, of technique uh, could improve the health of the stream and whatever, but th that's, going forward, they might be able to say, well, let's maybe when we reconstruct going further down, uh, here's a better way to, to create recreate those streams. Even though they're not remediating, remediating the channel, they are remediating the banks. So thank you. Yes, you bet. I, I agree with that. I mean, it, you know, the goal is just to, you know, hopefully some of these data are value to people and they can, you know, uh, incorporate some different techniques going forward. Um, you know, uh, that's that's great. I mean, that's gravy on on the potatoes for me. Outstanding. Well, we're we remain conscious of the fact that people are taking their uh, lunch break to get involved here, and we appreciate the attendance. Most of all, Rob, we appreciate your insights and expertise and all the hard work you do for your students and your students have done for the system. So thanks very much, and we will be in touch. Um, everybody. Um, of interest, the Rob's presentation will be available on the Upper Clark Fork Working Group's website. Thanks again, Rob, and we'll be in touch about plans for next month. Thank you very much, Mari. Thanks to Thank everyone you, for attending. Thanks. Hey, on. Okay. Really quick, Mari, did you want uh, to mention anything about the Clark Fork Science Forum? Well, other than the fact that we're holding it in late April here in Missoula, it's going to be the first sort of um, compilation. No, that's not the right word. Amalgamation of the traditional uh, Clark Fork Symposium that Vicki Watson championed for so many years and the USGS's annual um, sort of brainstorming over their activities. And we're going to try to set this up so that it occurs every other year um, and move it around the Upper Clark Fork Basin so folks can get involved. Uh, and the information on this is available on the uh, website as well. Okay. Great. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, guys. Thanks,